Welcome to Dentlinks. Thank you for joining us on this uh, interesting webinar. The purpose of these presentations is to address topics that are part of our, probably your daily practice, give you our experience in managing these cases, go in detail as far as the uh, approach in the surgical or prosthetic treatment. And uh, hopefully, uh, at the end of this presentation, we'll give you some hints and uh, some keys that you bring back home with you for the next case you will be treating, give you some uh, insight as to how to do it better, probably. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comment box and we'll be more than happy to uh, answer them as the present at the end of the presentation. The topic that we have selected today is implant placed in the molar extraction site. Uh, why so? Because this is something that we believe has interesting features to describe. Uh, most uh, in most of the cases, people like to address the topic in the aesthetic side. But why not finding, trying to find appropriate solutions to a successful outcome of the implant place in uh, motor sites? Our concerns when we uh, are in such a situation are, and probably queries, can we um, extract the motor in an atraumatic way? What happens if there would fractures? Uh, how aggressive should we be or should we not be in extracting this tooth? And we, can we still place the implant if the, the socket has been damaged? How, how far can we go? And should we do it immediately if there has been an extensive surgery done in order to remove the residual root tips? It is, of course, a, a clear understanding from the start that there is a need to have an intraumatic extraction of the molar, keeping the, the socket behind us in as, uh, as the best possible uh, anatomy. Uh, if there is a need to uh, uh, surgically uh, treat the area in order to remove the roots, then uh, the question comes, can we still place the implant in the molars, in the smaller site? The second concern is, can we, are we capable of placing the implant in an ideal position? Since we don't have really a good bone volume, we have often time two, sometimes three rules if we're talking about maxillary motors, can we still place the implant where we want it to be? Do we have enough bone to support the implant in the position we want it to be? The third question is, can we anticipate uh, the possibility of primary implant stability? Do we have enough information that we can uh, probably pre-op or pre-operatively collect uh, in order to know whether at the end of the implant placement we will have stability that is good enough to, uh, uh, to maintain and to, to, to allow integration of the implant. The, uh, the fourth concern is can we place an implant if you have a chronic infection? You know, why not an acute infection? Can we extract a tooth that has an apical area, uh, an apical uh, chronic infection? and still be able to succeed in, the, uh, in, in this kind of procedure. Uh, now, what about the extraction size versus the implant diameter? We know that uh, in the molar side, we like to place a five millimeter diameter implant, but the extraction socket is oftentimes disproportionate with the implant size. The question that we ask ourselves now let's suppose you have placed this implant in this uh, large defect. Can we still expect to have 
bone to implant contact? Can this implant integrate in time and uh, have a good function years after it has been placed? Now, what should be the, the, the size of the socket when we start saying that this is not anymore an indication to place the implant? And finally, the quality of loss integration in view of the residual defect side. We still have a good integration, even if you have a very large defect side around the implant. And what happens in terms of long-term stability? Now, obviously, there are situations where it's not anymore indicated to place implant in the water side, particularly this particular case, where we have here an extraction socket, uh, uh, and we have literally no bone left to place the implant. You can see here the nerve flush with the apical part of the extraction site. So this is not anymore an indication for immediate implant placement. So what do we do in that case? Well, obviously we need to graft the socket. We can use endogenous bone, we can use a bone substitute, we can use calcium sulfate. We can use a mixture of all these things. We need to cover this with the membrane or not, depending on the type of defect we have. Obtain a closure and then wait enough four months in general to place the implant in a proper position. And here the situation three years more slowly. Now, more commonly, this is what we see clinically. This is an extracted first molar with an interradicular bone that is thin. In that particular case, the interradicular bone is a little larger. In that case, it's larger, but we have a dehiscence on the of it. In that case, the gap is huge. And the question is, can we still place an implant in that case? What about this situation where we have no interradicular bone? Can we still place an implant in that situation? Can we still place the implant in the proper position with a good primary stability and obtain a good long-term function on an implant? Or shall we socket preserve, do a socket preservation technique, wait four months or even longer if there is no more buccal or lingual, and then place the implant in a more appropriate way? No. Here is a situation we, where we have a large defect on the buccal side, where we lost the mesial bone on the mesial side and on the distal side. But we have a good interradicular bone. Can we still place an implant in that case and obtain a good function? What about if you have several extraction sites? Where, what is the position? Where should we position the implant? On that second bone in this mesial socket or right in between? The distance between these two becomes too large to ensure a good emergence profile of the implant, of the crowns, and have an appropriate cleaning done by the patient. What about this situation where we have no bone on the buccal side and the bone that remains that can be used for implant placement is on the parietal side? Can we place the implant in this parietal socket? Do we still have a good emergence profile? And have a good crown that allows a proper maintenance post operative What about this situation of the second model? I will show you all these cases treated, of course. The second model, when we just extracted, extracted that second model with a large defect, can we still place an implant? Now, obviously, there are factors that intervene in our decision-making process. But the first one is the socket pose integrity. When we extracted the tooth, how many walls of the socket remain? Do we have a dehiscence? Do we have a fenestration? How difficult was the tooth extraction? And did we really traumatize the site at the time of extraction? Enough to justify the non-placement of the implant. Or the extraction has been done in a way that allows the implants to be placed immediately. Why do we like to replace it immediately? Because that saves time. That saves time to the patient in three months after the implant has been placed. The, the implant restoration can be placed and the patient gain function again. 
So time becomes an important issue besides talking about two surgeries, one for extracting, one for pressing the implant. So if we can combine this in one procedure, of course, it's most likely to the greater benefit of the patient. Now, the second factor we always consider is the presence of the intradictal septum. It's high and it's weak. Now, I showed you earlier cases where you had no intradictal no bone. So in that case, you can we still place the implant? We still can do it. If you have a thick bone on the lingual side, if you have a good enough bone apical to the area we want to implant. That is the need to have three millimeters of bone apical to the roots, distant from the inferior aerial nerve or adjacent vital structures like the sinus. If you don't have bone apical to the root, it becomes much more difficult to place an implant and gain enough primary stability. Now the fourth consideration that is of importance is the bone soft tissue quality at the future implant site. Now bone is not always easy to predict in terms of quality. So when you start drilling, if you have a bone that is of no consistency, you have to, be, to, to appreciate the fact that oftentimes after this, the, the, the size has been, the site has been drilled, the implant may not be in, uh, in, a, in, in a sufficient stability to allow, the, to, to allow us to continue the procedure. So bone, soft tissues, if we lack soft tissues, if we don't have a poor soft tissues, again, this can be a problem. Why do we lack soft tissues? Because of the previous infection, because the, the gingiva has been uh, destroyed by, uh, by gum disease or by an infected process. And the last consideration is, can if the site has been the site of uh, chronic infection, we would not really very much worry about that. We can extract the roots, curate the site properly, and still place the implant. And we see uh, what do we have in terms of science to support this particular approach. Now, the, the, the dangers of, of, of the one of one of them is the one that really should worry us the most. This patient came to us like this, the implant was placed in the socket, but the, the, the surgeon, as he was drilling the site to place the implant, didn't really appreciate uh, the, uh, the consistency of the bone enough and placed the implant in order to gain stability, went further apically and hit the nerve and the patient came with a paresthesia of the lip that is not always easy to, uh, to gain back. Uh, to normality if the implant has been placed for a longer time. So as soon as this kind of situation is diagnosed, implant needs to be removed immediately in order to allow the repair process to start. So one of the dangers of, uh, of, of, uh, of this procedure in the lower jaw is uh, when the bone is not of a good consistency, is to go further implicate than needed and hit the vital structure, that is in that case, the inferior aerial nerve. Now, let's talk about specifics now. This is a molar that needed to be extracted because of a really little two structures remaining that can be interesting for, to, uh, to, to use for the reconstruction of the tooth. So we decided to extract the tooth. Now, how do we do it? First of all, we said atraumatic extraction, so separate the roots here separate the two roots and remove each one of these roots separately in the least traumatic way. And we're left in that case with a socket like this. We have a septum that is thin. Now, how to drill in here and gain this kind of positioning of the implant right in the middle without having the drill to slip in either one of the adjacent sockets. The, 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 we should be able to start to to, to put the to, to, to put the drilling in the area where we, where we where we want where we want the twist drill to go. So we use use a sharp drill and the positioning drill and we go in the socket where we want the twist drill to go secondary. And we go further apically, since we have here three millimeters at least of bone apical to the side, we go apically deep enough 
So when we use a twist rim number two, that we can reach this area with the, without having the drill to slip in either one of these two circuits. And then we continue the progressive drilling of the site. We enlarge the site, typically in most of the cases, because there is no more bone here on the knees and nor on the distance. So we have to concentrate in our drilling, keep the direction first, stay in the site where we want the drilling to be, and then go further epically enough in order to, to, to have a good primary stability of the implant when, when we come to places. And this is what we gained here. We had the good primary stability. Now, we fill the residual socket with an organic bovine bone. In that particular case, you can use a tangerous bone, you can use calcium sulfate, you can use mineralized freeze dry bone, and any kind of bone substitutes. In that particular case, the result would be practically the same. Now the question is, do we need to cover this with a membrane? We'll discuss all these issues. Do we need to cover this with a membrane? In a contained four world effect, it doesn't seem to be something that is of importance. So in case we have a very large effect, we want to obtain a kind of more generation effect, it may be interesting to put a membrane. But if the defect is not too large, the necessity of placing a membrane is not there. Now, the second, do we need to close? Do we need to work submerged or do we need to work non-submerged? Now, it has been our preference in handling these cases to close the area. It is not something that is supported all the time by the literature. And this is the situation when the, when the implant is placed with the bone, so with, the, with the substitutes in the residual cell. Now, ask the question, again, do we need to submerge or don't we need to submerge? And do we need to fill the residual defect with the, an organic bovine? In this study that was published in 2012, 40 patients were treated and the implant were placed flappers. 20 of these implants uh, were placed and the residual defect were filled with xenografts and the other 20 implants there has been no graft place. In all those cases where the, where, where, the, where the porcine bone was placed, it was possible to avoid further bacolingual crystal and uh, the change of bacolingual bone resorption and changes in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in, in the socket. So it seems to be interesting to fill the socket with bone. Not that we cannot gain stability if we don't fill the socket with bone, but if you want to preserve the bone with it is preferable to add no substitutes. Now, this is the result in that case, as you can see. We ended up with little attached gingiva on the buckle side. And the question that is often asked, if we do this translation flap and remove the flap coronary to close the bone, do we lose the attached gingiva buckle, the keratinized gingiva? This is the healing. It's not yet complete. This is four months post-loading. Post you know, crown placing, so we, we still wait for this area to remodel. It takes some time uh, nine months to a year before we have a complete result, as you will see in the case that I will show you later. This is another situation where we have an interradicular bone that is about two millimeter width wide. Now, again, the critical part of this of drilling is the first two drills you will be using. The one that served to position, to, uh, to, to, uh, to place, the, to, to put the drilling where we want it to be, that is the positioning drilling. And deep enough in bone in order to have the twist drill really placed with a, with, a good, uh, with a good preparation of the site without having this drill to slip in one of the uh, residual uh, implant uh, uh, root sockets. So it is important again to position properly the twist rail number two and then as we go make sure that your hand is stable and you keep on drilling on in, in the same direction in order to uh, really be able to uh, maintain the position in the final position of the implant. and here the implant has been placed with a good primary stability the socket was again filled with the uh, uh, substitutes we have three millimeters of uh, buccal keratinized mucosa. And the question we ask, are we going to lose that keratinized gingiva if we close the wound like this in the primer and we submerge the implant? Now let's see what happens in the healing process. 
This is the situation some three years later. And you see that we still have this keratinized gingiva around this uh, uh, privacy extraction site. You see the nice healing, in spite of the large defect that was around the implant, and the filling of this defect with the xenograft, three years post loading, we can see this one has not resolved yet. This substitute probably will remain here for a number of years. It will be, it serves as a substrate for bone, for bone appositioning, but it will still be there as if it is part of the mineralized structures of the bone. But the situation is very stable. And again, uh, moving the, the, the flap coronary to close the wound will not, uh, uh, will not uh, end up with the loss of keratinized tissue on the body side. Now, this is in this clinical study that published in 2009, called the, road, the outcome of submerged versus non-submerged implant. It seems that the result is the same whether we submerge or not submerge in this extraction socket side. But there is a reduction, they see, of keratinized tissue in the submerged. This we could not observe in our series or series of cases that we have treated. Probably that we have maybe a little less in gingiva, but it is good enough to sustain function in time. Now let's see in this case. The second the question that we often ask ourselves is how deep should we place the implant in bone? Not only we should be right positioned in the proper place, but how deep should we place it? Should we place it flush with the residual extraction socket, or should we go one or two millimeters further apically? If this if we have the possibility of doing it, because sometimes we don't have enough bone apical to the, to the socket and the corona to the inferior apical nerve to allow us to place the implant further than uh, what we want it we wanted to be. So this is the site was the, the, this foot was extracted and this is the socket now. We have a good amount of bone in the interradicular area. And no matter what we do sometimes, the tendency is for the implant to slip in one of the two sockets. But again, try to keep to stay in the middle. In that particular case, we started to drill here, and then as the drilling progressed, we were capable of placing the implant in the proper position. Now, do we place it flush with the bone or apical? In that particular case, we went two millimeters further down. Now, question that is, I have, do, do we have enough evidence on that? Um, comparing the situation of the crested placement versus placing two millimeters subcrestal in this experimental model. The crestal group, the uh, bone to implant contact at eight week was the range of 44.5%, at 12 week about 40%. And in the subcrestal group, uh, the, the bone to implant contact was a little bit better than in the case of the crestal group. Beside, there has been less bone resorption in the subcrestal group lingually in that experimental model. Now, where, what do we use to fill the socket? Can we use endogenous bone? Do we need to use more substitutes? At the time in this situation where we have lingual tori, we like to take advantage of this bone using a bone scraper. We can go there and, and take this bone out, harvest this bone, and then graft it. And we can coronally put some of the bone substitute or mix it, mix, mix it with the with, with the endogenous bone. In that case, we used the one-step approach. The buckle and lingual flaps were, we, we, we could really close this primarily. Uh, we placed the helix about them. This is the situation three months later, and you can appreciate the nice healing of the socket. And this is how it goes in geographically. This is the side of time of implant placement. Again, it is important to place the impact in the appropriate position in the socket. Fill the residual defect, with whatever material you do, it is your preference to use, version of bone, or any substitutes. This is the situation uh, after uh, the crown placement, and that is one and a half years later. And you can see that, appreciate the fact that the bone remodels very nicely, even though the defect measured in this study was uh, big. Now, what about the, in placing the implant in the fresh extraction socket and using the uh, bone uh, substitutes, do we need to submerge in that case or not, or, or, or keep the, uh, or, or use a non-submerge approach? Uh, the, uh, in this experimental model, the implant placed placing fresh 
extraction sites that had two millimeter gap, and the socket was filled with the bios and the color bio guide. And there has been two ways to approach the, 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 in the same animal, either submerge the implant or keep it in submerged. And in the end, there has been no difference between the submerged and non-submerged protocol, which means that so many times, uh, clinicians like not to submerge. It has been our preference to submerge because that probably also um, limit the necessity of seeing the patient often post-operatively, insisting on the oral hygiene, asking the patient not to eat on this uh, operated area and uh, not seeing some of these granules that we have placed to, uh, in, in the residual toughening defect uh, to be uh, found in the patient's mouth. They said they have it, some sense coming in the mouth. This kind of uh, situation they would like to avoid. And uh, possibly also, why not, uh, limit the soft tissue invasion of the uh, crusted part of, the, uh, of this uh, material that we have placed to fill the socket. So we tend to privilege the uh, submerged approach, but it does not mean that the non-submerged is not an, uh, a good approach to, uh, to use in that particular situation. Now, in order to fill the defect, there has been some uh, technical twists described here and there. This is a situation where we have a large interradicular bone. So again, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the initiating drill, we, we go where we want to be, and then further epically in order to have good stability when we do the twist drill number two, we place a guide pin here, and then, and then enlarge the site. Once the site has been enlarged, uh, uh, fill the residual area with the uh, bone, and then place the implant. So reverse the situation. You can do it either way. Either place the graft before placing the implant, or place the implant and then place the graft. And I think it's both ways prove to be quite effective. Uh, in that particular case, again, we like to cover the site to make sure that the site has been uh, to prevent any any loss of uh, the material that we have placed in the patient's mouth. And then this is the healing one year later. And you can appreciate here this area uh, that has been grafted around the implant and the right positioning of the implant where we want it to be really. So again, just to summarize this particular point, can we place the implant in a proper position? Yes, it is possible. Now, how do we do it, do this to, in order to make sure that we have placed, we can we, we place it in a proper position? Well, start with the initiating drill, go deep enough, use the twist drill number two, deep enough in bone, as much as you can of the situation anatomically allows you to do so. And then, Keep on really uh, augment the, uh, the the side by using progressive drilling of the side, and then make sure that when you drill, you keep the direction that you have initially started. Now, if you have two exception sites, I presented this in the earlier in this presentation. You have two motors that needed to be extracted for predominant reasons, and then where do we start? This is our first drilling. Try to stay at least five millimeters away from the adjacent tooth. And then what about the second one? If we go here, we're too far. So we need to be in that socket. This is what we did. So we drilled here and we are in the practically intermediate and a little bit on the impinging on the distant uh, root socket. And then uh, the, the second implant was placed in this area where we can uh, have practically a four-wall defect. Uh, this, the site was closed, and this is the healing three years post-loading, and you can appreciate the amount of uh, the, the stability of the situation in terms of marginal bone loss and the quality of the gingiva in the area. Now, what if we have lost, we had a dehiscence on one of the roots, like in this case? Can we still place the implant immediately? Yes, we can. We can place the implant in an ideal position again using this uh, drilling sequence that we have described. Fill the residual defect with bone, and if it is a four-wall defect, we don't need to use a membrane. Uh, the, 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 the socket would heat properly without the, the need of placing a membrane. If uh, even if we have this 
little dehiscence on the on the meser root, uh, the the bone that you place in the residual socket is about enough to to support the implant and have a good bone to implant contact. We close the wound in order to again to have a good uh, prim primary closure that prevent uh, the material loss. And this is three years post loading and have a good integration. Again, again, I tell you, it is important to have the implant placed in the proper position as to the adjacent roots. Now, what about the cases where we have no uh, interreligious receptor, like in this particular site? And we still believe that we have enough bone to place the implant. Now, look where we started the drilling. The positioning, uh, in the, the drill, the positioning drill is on the lingual side. Where the bone is, so we place we, we, we place our first drilling here, and we call uh, enough apically in order to have a, a good drilling, a, a good use of the two millimeters with drilling. And then, as the site is progressively prepared, you can see that you you you're leaning on the lingual bone, leaning on the lingual bone, and the further you go, the more you will see the site. Uh, uh, being prepared adequately and with a proper positioning of the implant. And as we do so, we kind of see the bone forming on the sides. You see here, you see here the bone forming on the sides. And then we place the implant where we had no socket initially. Again, starting on the lingual side. And then finally, we can see the implant in the proper position at the end. And the residual defect is filled with bone as usual, covered with a collagen freeze here just to prevent the loss of this material. Boy, we're suturing, we close, and this is the integration three years post loading. Now, what about this, this case of the second model to be replaced? We have a very large defect. We have no interradicular septum. So, where are we going to place the impact and stabilize it? We're going to lean on the mesial bone here. So start preparing here on the mesial. This is an implant. So we don't need to worry much about the root that is uh, uh, diversion distant. So we start drilling on this side. We lean on the mesial bone. And we had an excellent primary stability of the implant. With a huge residual defect. But this is of no importance. It's not of any importance. It can be filled with a autogenous bone or a mixture of autogenous bone and bone substitutes. And the wound is closed. And this is what we see after healing. This is a time of a bone connection. Do a limited incision. Have an access to the cover screw, remove the cover screw, place the healing abutment, and then this is the implant in proper position. And you see the graft here. This is in 10, 2017, and this is one year later. And you can still see that this is still healing. The, the wound is dark. We probably had about half a millimeter or 0.75 millimeters of bone loss on the distal side, but the rest is healing quite properly. Now, again, this is a side where we have two roots and a good interradicular bone. As we do this, sometimes, no matter how precaution we take, we have tendency to fall in one of the two residual sockets. Keep the direction when drilling. When you drill, keep on leaning on the bone, misery or distal, in order to finally come with the bone with an implant that is placed in the proper position. So you have to be able to maintain the direction uh, when drilling. This is the implant finally in place with the bone, and then you close the wound. What about here? Well, we have absolutely no interradicular bone. Where are we going to? What? Where are we going to place the implant and have a good stability? And on what bone do we need to need? On the lingual bone, preferably. So we start the drilling towards the lingual. And as we drill and enlarge the site, we keep on maintaining the direction and leaning on the lingual bone. Keep ourselves two millimeters distant from the buckle bone. The bone, buckle bone is more fragile and will dissolve more readily than the lingual bone. And here is the implant in place with the the bone substitutes that fill the defect and the healing one year later. Now, in that particular case, when we have a thick interdicular bone, but we have lost the bone on the upper side of the mesial and on the distal root. 
The bone is of an excellent quality. Where do we start the drilling? Always start a little bit more dingually, a little bit more to the lingual side. And as we increase the position in brain, and as we enlarge, this is after the twist ring number two. See the defect here and the defect here. This is of no concern, no problem. We keep on drilling until we have a good stability of the implant, and here we go. As we drill, we gain more bone. Here we go, here it goes. And then the implant is placed in the proper position. In order to do so again, keep the direction in the Keep the direction. Place the implant with a good primary stability. And the filter individual defect, cover it with the collagen fleece. You don't need more than that. You see, this is where the natural, the native bone is. So even if you, you fill this with, the, with the, some bone substitutes, it is going to be enough to produce enough bone to implant contact in that case and maintain the implant in function long of the time. So this is a situation, again, three years post-loading, and you appreciate the direction that we have used in order to drill the, the, uh, to, to drill the side to place the implant. So it is important to maintain that direction when we, when we use. And what about the maxilla? Maxilla is a bit more difficult. In that case, we need to extract that one that was really badly damaged and unrestorable. So when we extracted the tooth, again, atraumatically, on the buccal side, we had no bone. The sinus was very close. The only bone that was available for placing a 5 by 10 millimeter implant was around the palatal root. Now, again, if we place the implant on that side, could we still be able to place it in a proper position to allow a proper restoration, second level? Well, this has to be appreciated at the time of drilling. We put the first drill and we put the guide pin inside the socket and we see if we are in line with the adjacent crowns. And this is the case, we don't need to worry much about the situation here. So we can place the implant, yes, and fill the residual defect. And then close the wound, close the wound properly. This is the healing, that's at the time of a button connection and the implant function. As yes, you can see here, the sinus was very low on the bucket root, but it was appropriate on the dist on the parietal root. So we used the bone of the parietal root to place the implant in the proper position. Now that becomes a little bit more difficult. We just extracted those two roots, and this is what we have left. We have enough bone to use to be able to place two implants in that molar sites. So we start drilling. Make sure that the distance between the two implants is appropriate. Use the appropriate size of implant and the appropriate positioning of the implant as the drilling progresses. And then do not worry about the residual defect because that can be easily fixed with bone or bone substitutes, as it was the case here. It's more difficult because we need to be parallel, we need to place the, the drill in a proper position. We need to be distant from the adjacent crown here, the adjacent the tool. We need to be distant, uh, uh, have an appropriate distance from the adjacent border tool and have a good inter implant distance also. So drilling becomes really, in, really a, a critical issue in the success of this kind of procedure. Cover the side of the collagen fleece and then close. And this is what we can see here after implant placement. Again, a traumatic extraction means that we have to separate the roots. We have to use a, a twist drill, a, a drill uh, that will cut easy distally and then cut in between the buckle roots and remove each root separately, leaving the least amount of damage. It's not always very possible to do it because these roots are badly decayed sometimes and we need to go, we need to drill around uh, the fissure burr in order to be able to have access to the root for extraction. And that is when we have removed the root. And this bone here is very important. That interradicular bone is very important to stabilize the implant. And this is what we did. So we need to drill properly. Tendency is for the drill to slip in one of these sockets. So keep the direction. Make sure that initially the first drill has been done properly and then this drill number two has been used in the proper direction and then keep the direction. What we did is we filled the residual defect 
with the bone substitute. We use the connective tissue operator in order to close the wound and gain attached gingiva around. That is the situation post healing, some three years post healing. Now, this is a second model that we just extracted. This site is huge. Again, the question we ask ourselves, are we capable of having a good primary stability after drilling? Can we predict that? Well, we can predict it. it this largely depends on the quality of bone we're working with. If the bone is of no consistency, do not try to fix the input. It will be loose at the end of the preparation of the site. Sometimes you underprepare the site. You need to place a five millimeters implant, we use until the four millimeter drill, and then we place the implant. So we need to play around with the twisting sequence, the draining sequence, in order to gain finally a good primary stability. Why do we insist on having this done? Because again, it's a gain of time for the patient. It is not always available for several visits and treatment. We can do here a socket preservation, wait four months, place the implant again. But if you can do it in one shot, it is much, much easier on the patient. So place the implant properly. Here we got a 40 Newton primary stability of the implant. We fill the residual defect in bone graft. And here is the situation now. Now, this is a side that is really a, a, an approach that we have used also in, in occasion in some cases. This would need to be extracted because of the knees of this crack. So what we did is we removed the buckle root. We left the buckle root, the parata root in place until the soft tissue healed. And then we extracted the parata root, it is, and we placed the implant immediately in the parata root. This we could place a 13 by 5 implant. And if you look at the x-ray, there was no bone on the buccal side. The sinus was very low on the buccal side. The only bone that was available was on the parietal side. And we have the illusion that this implant has this place in the sinus. Wrong. It is in the socket, parallel to the sinus. This is in 2001. Now look at the situation 15 years later. The implant is still holding perfectly well. It is unfortunately not in an ideal position, but we had no choice. If we didn't do this, then we have to wait, socket preserve the site, and probably do some sinus floor elevation, whether internal or external sinus lift, in order to be able to place the implant. The question is, if we're not in an ideal position, like in this particular case, would this crown stand the test of time and function? Would we still be able to function on this implant in time? Well, it seems to be the case here. This is 15 years post-loading. Now, the problem also may be the access to this buccal area of the implant for maintenance, for hygiene. Then the crown has to be done in a proper way to allow for this to be possible. So again, these, this is done, this is a conservative approach to, the hand, to, the, to handling a case like this. Other means can be done, other ways can be done, of course, like socket preservation or external or internal sinus lift. But if you want to do it in a, like a straightforward case like this and quite effectively and rapidly, uh, we can use take advantage of the bone present on the parietal root and gain in time proper function. Now, in the lower jaw, the question that you ask here. It, this two roots have to be extracted because of a crack on the mesial roots of these two with a large uh, chronic infection in the side. Can we extract and place the implant immediately? So what do we have here? Situation where we have a fractures of the first and second bone. The presence of a chronic infection on, in this area and in this area, we have a large defect of the second bone. So how are we going to place the implant and gain a primary stability? And but we have, interestingly, quite a distance, as we, as, as we can see here on this combined CT done uh, post-extraction, uh, immediately uh, we have the combine in the office, so we can extract and take the combine immediately and try to find out whether it is possible to place the implant immediately. And as you can see here, the inferior nerve is quite 
uh, apical. So we have plenty of bone here to primarily anchor the implant, which is what we did. Look at here. How did we manage to do this case? But starting again with the, with the, with the initiating drain, where we want the first implant to be. And then we do the twist drill number two and place the guide pin. And then we go to drill the second uh, implant site, parallel to the first one. And then here are the final position of the two implants. In spite of the very large defect of the second molar, we were able to gain a 40 Newton primary stability on this implant. Look at the position of the implant as to where it should be. In, uh, anatomically and, uh, and uh, uh, as to the uh, opposite occlusion. Now, in that particular case, we use a vaginous bone to fill the defect we were in the, in the uh, uh, second molar area. All we had to do is to release the flap a little bit into the bone scraper. We went on the external oblique ridge and harvested some bone, filled the defect with bone and bone substitutes, also the bone, and then covered with the collagen fleece. And here you can see the situation the excellent primary stability of these two implants placed in, in, uh, in a site that was chronically infected. Now, the question is, we ask you, do we have enough literature on that? Can you place the implant in a chronically infected site and still obtain good result on the long term? Now, this is one of the studies I advise you to read. It was published in 2013. A progressive controlled clinical trial that evaluate clinically, radiographically, and aesthetically the outcome after five years of immediately placing the implant in suffered with very apical pathology. So, uh, 27 patients were seen in that series and uh, followed for five years uh, after immediate implant placement. 12 patients had very apical pathologies and the control group were 15 patients without very apical pathology. And the patients were assessed clinically, aesthetically, and geographically. And the outcome was clear, the replacement of teeth exhibiting pre-apical pathologies by implant placed immediately after tooth extraction can be a successful treatment modality with no disadvantages in clinical, aesthetical, and geographic parameters to immediately place implant into healthy circles. There has been no signs at five years of apical pre-implant. This is the message I wanted to give you today. I hope it really helped. It will help you in treating these kind of situations. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer them. Put them in the drop box, and uh, we'll be more than happy to give you the answers to, to the best of our knowledge. Thank you again for being with us, and hope to we'll see you next on our forthcoming uh, uh, upcoming seminars. Or we'll be discussing specific topics related to uh, things you do in your daily practice. Thank you again.